Let's start out by looking at a subject that anyone interested in either computer science or data science needs to understand, namely logic. And let's do it in the classic manner by using so-called Boolean algebra. A propositional variable, also known as a Boolean variable, is a variable that can have one of two values. It can either have the value true or it can have the value false. And a logical function or a Boolean function takes one, two, three, or more Boolean values as arguments and returns a Boolean value. Any of you have programmed are familiar with defining such functions. And the interesting thing about such a function is it's completely specified by its so-called truth table. This is absolute brute force. What you do is you take every possible value for the input or inputs and list the function value. So for the function not, which reverses the truth value of its argument, you can say if p is true, not p is false. If p is false, not p is true. And that tells you absolutely everything that can be known about the function. There are two other primitive functions in Boolean algebra, namely OR and AND, and we can specify them by their truth tables also. OR is a function of two Boolean variables, P and Q, and its value is true if both P and Q are true, or if one or the other is true while the second is false. The only time you get a false out of OR is if both its input values are false. So there's the truth table that tells you everything about OR. And the function AND, as you might guess from its name, has the value true only if both its arguments are true. If either argument is false, its value is false. Now let's consider how we might generate these truth tables using R. There's a function outer in R that's going to be very important for us later in the course in conjunction with so-called chi-squared tests and independence of variables. But let's learn about it in a simple context. It takes two vectors, and those vectors have components that are all possible arguments of the function, and it makes a matrix of function values. You're familiar with this operation from elementary school when you learn tables of addition facts and multiplication facts. So look at the, let's look at the multiplication facts in the finite field Z3. The rule is you take two numbers, A and B, which can be 0, 1, or 2. You multiply them together, divide by 3, and keep the remainder. And if I ask outer to act on a pair of vectors, both 0 through 2, and evaluate this function, it says, for example, when I get 0 and 0 as arguments, the product is 0. When I get 1 and 2 as arguments, the product is 2. And the only time when we differ from conventional elementary arithmetic is that 2 times 2 is equal to 1, because when you divide 4 by 3, the remainder is 1. So there are the multiplication facts for Z3. We can also get the facts for the AND operation. We can say, yep, we got two inputs. The possible values of each are represented by the same vector, true and false. And in C, the way you collect values together into a vector is by putting C in front of them. And outer then tells us, yes, indeed, with this function, which I have named and, if both the inputs are true, the function value is true. Otherwise, we get false. Similarly, we can confirm that in R, a single ampersand represents and, and a single vertical bar represents or. The only trick here 
which I had to look up, is that if you want to use an operator with outer, you have to put it in double quotes. So here is and, and here indeed is the table that shows it's only when you have true and true as your inputs that you get true as the output. For or, on the other hand, the only way to get false as the output is to have both the inputs be false. Now comes a tricky issue. There is another operator in R that represents and. It's a double ampersand. And similarly, a double vertical bar represents or. But these only work on single Boolean variables. They don't work on vectors. In the jargon of R, they are not vectorized operators. So to show you what they do, I have to ask what's true and true. It's true. What's true? Double ampersand false. It's false. All the others are false. Similarly, true, double vertical bar, true gives me true. And the only way I can get false is by computing false, double vertical bar, false. An easy mistake to make when you're analyzing data sets in R is to use the double operator when you should have used the single operator. So if you're dealing with single truth values, you can use either operator. Whether I evaluate the expression 2 greater than 3 and 2 greater than 0 with a double ampersand or a single ampersand, the answer is that statement is false. Whether I evaluate 2 greater than 3 or 2 greater than 0 with a double or single vertical bar, I get the answer true. So for working on single truth values, these operators work the same way. But the only ones that are vectorized are the single ampersand and single vertical bar. So if I say operate component by component on true false and true true using and, it says the answer is the vector true false. True and true is true, false and true is false. If I do the same thing using a double ampersand, it operates just on the first component and produces the value true. And you'll discover when we start working with data sets, you might well want to carry out operations like this on columns of data frames with hundreds or thousands of rows in them. When you were learning trigonometry, you spent a lot of time on so-called trig identities. And the reason for the existence of trigonometric identities is that, in general, there are many different formulas for the same trigonometric function. I hope you remember, for example, that cosine of 2x is the same function as cosine squared x minus sine squared x, is the same function as 2 cosine squared x minus 1, is the same function as 1 minus 2 sine squared x. If you ever end up grading a calculus course, you'll discover when the homework problems on integrating trig functions have to be graded, there may be half a dozen different correct answers for the same integration problem. Something very similar happens in Boolean algebra. If you have a logical function, there are frequently a large number of different ways of writing it in terms of not, and, and, or. And you could write vast homework assignments on this theme. How do you prove that two formulas generate the same function? You show that they generate the same truth table. This is the same idea as showing that two formulas generate the same trigonometric function by graphing them both and show that they generate exactly the same graph. When two formulas define the same function, we can call them equivalent. And it's conventional to use a triple horizontal bar instead of an equal sign for this. 
So here is a formula of Boolean algebra. Not P and Q is the same function as not P or not Q, sometimes known as De Morgan's Law. How do we prove this? By brute force. We make a table with all possible combinations of values of P and Q, and then we go through it line by line. For example, in the second line, when P is true and Q is false, P and Q is false. The negation of that, not P and Q, is true. If we look at the right-hand side, we can say not P is false, not Q is true, and since one of those has the value true, the OR of not P and not Q is true. True here, true here. Do it for all four rows. Say this row, column and this column are the same, therefore the functions are the same. This, of course, is just crying out for automation by computer. If you have more than two arguments, then your truth table just gets bigger. When you have three variables, the truth table has eight rows. And the conventional way of writing one of these truth tables, which will become important very soon, is in the first column you show P changing as slowly as possible. In the next column you show Q going twice from true back to false. And then in the third column you show R rap varying as rapidly as possible. This gives you all possible combinations of true and false for the three arguments in the conventional order. Again, let's look at just the second row. Q and R, well, one of them is false, so the result is false. P or Q and R, well, P is true. That's enough to give us true. P or Q, well, P is true. That's good enough. P or R, P is true. That's good enough. The result is true. You do this for all eight rows. Have a look at this column. Have a look at that column. You say, they're the same, and there is your proof. We have proved the so-called distributive law that the OR operation is distributive with respect to the AND operation. Now let's consider how to do this in R. We need an R function that's similar in spirit to outer, but a bit more powerful. And again, this will be very useful when we start doing probability next time. The function is named expand grid, and it's an automatic way of generating Cartesian products of sets. Let me show you what I mean by that. Let's call expand grid with the pair of vectors true-false and true-false. What does it do? It gives me the four possible pairs of a value from the first vector and a value from the second vector. And slightly annoyingly, it does this in a way that the first variable is the one that changes most rapidly. If I call this on three vectors true-false, which is something I couldn't easily have done with outer, then I get something that looks very much like the first three columns of my truth table. And now I can fix this up. I say, I'd really like to reverse the order of these columns. So I'm going to take the existing data frame, which I have stored in a variable named eg, and say, I want this, but I want to take three columns, three, two, and one in that order. Just to check that I've got it right, I display this variable ttbl. And indeed, I now have a setup where the first column varies slowly. The last one varies rapidly. But I'd really like those to be called p, q, and r. How do I do this? Well, I search through the documentations, and I suddenly find that for a data frame like ttbl, I can evaluate a function, call names, for that data frame and assign to it the vector with the three strings p, q, and r. And presto, now I've got something that looks like exactly what I want for an automated data frame. Now let's attach more columns to it. 
I want to use the names P, Q, and R rather than T, T, B, L, dollar sign, P, and so on. And I can do that by using the R function attach. When you call attach with the data frame as its argument, what you're saying is I can use the columns of that data frame without specifying the data frame itself. So for example, I can take P or Q and R and save that in ttbl dot dollar sign op1. Let's see what we get as a result. I've added a new column to the data frame. This is later be going, to come, going to become a standard way of doing calculations on data sets. I can also create an op2 column in which I take P and R or Q and R. And now you see the importance of these vectorized operations, because this operation is being carried out simultaneously on all the rows in the data frame. And now I look and I say, hey, what do you know? Op1 and Op2 are exactly the same. That proves my results. I can even generate random logical functions, which is going to become interesting in a short while. How do I do it? Well, I'll create a new column called Rand1. And the way I do it is ask R to take eight samples from the vector true-false. And I ask it to do it with replacement, because if I don't ask for this, it's going to say, well, I chose true. The only other choice I had was false. I got two, and I can't give you any more. So we have to do what's called sampling without replacement. And here's the result. I call exactly the same function, and I get a different answer. So I now have a data frame with two different um, randomly generated columns in it. Now let's think a bit about computers at the lowest level. At the lowest level, computers operate on individual bits. It might be, for example, that the bit 1 is represented by a high voltage, the bit 0 is represented by a low voltage. And if you want to do something primitive, like adding two binary numbers, this is 3 because it is 1 plus 2. This is 7 because it's 1 plus 2 plus 2 squared. And I want to get the answer 10, which is 8 plus 2. And I can reduce that calculation to evaluating AND and OR. Why? Well, how do I do this binary arithmetic? I look at the rightmost bits. They're both 1s. If they're both 1s or if they're both zeros, I get a 0 in the sum. And that's the exclusive OR operation, XOR. But there's a difference between 1 plus 1 and 0 plus 0 because 1 plus 1 gives me 0 carry 1 to determine whether I get a carry that has to be included in the next operation. I apply the AND operator, which gives me a 1 only if I use two ones. So in the next operation, I have 1 plus 1 plus a 1, which is carried. That gives me 1 carry 1. 1 plus 1 is 0 carry 1. 0 plus 0 plus the carry is 1. And that at the lowest level is how computers do addition. You look at this and you say, oh, if I'm going to build my computer from scratch, I'd better have some electronics that does OR, some electronics that does NOT, and some electronics that does AND. Early in the history of computers, possibly even before, someone discovered that all three of these functions can be represented in terms of the function NAND, which is AND followed by NOT. So let's define a symbol for this, an up arrow symbol. In other words, P up arrow Q is NOT P and Q, or equivalently, NOT P or NOT Q. Now what can we do with up arrow, true, false, and parentheses? Well, 
if we take p not and true, that turns out to equal not p. So with our NAND gate, we can represent not. If we want to compute p and q, all we have to do is compute the negation of p not and q, and we now know how to do that. We take p not and q not and true, and now suddenly we've become circuit designers. A few decades out of date, but circuit designers nonetheless. So we say a NAND gate has two inputs, and these inputs can be constants, either high voltage or low voltage, or the output of another NAND gate. And by connecting these NAND gates together, I can build any logical circuit that I want. The details of this are best left to computer science courses, of course. But here, without a diagram, is how I could make an OR gate out of three NAND gates. My first NAND gate applies NAND to P and true, producing not P. The second does the same to produce not Q. The third one takes the output of the first two calculates the AND of them and then negates the result. And the simplest way of proving that this is correct is just to build a truth table. For any pair of values of P and Q, here's the output of the first gate, here's the output of the second gate, here's the result when they both go into the third gate, and the fact that the resulting truth table is the truth table for OR shows that I have succeeded. This concludes our brief introduction to Boolean algebra.